Let's dive into some XRP news, and this is going to blow you away because there are some big news around XRP and the future of maybe an ETF, a stablecoin, a lot to talk about. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Let's get right into it. I do want to thank our sponsor today, and that is Tangem. If you're looking at self-custody, this is the way to go. It is the number one wallet out there also, by the way, for XRP. That's right. You can actually integrate your XRP right into your Tangem wallet. Very simple. Uh, one of the only ways to do it, and the cool thing is, is you just go over to the Tangem website, download the app, also get your cards. You just go ahead and click on Get Tangem. Get that three card set, that way you got a backup. And this is one of the best ways for self-custody. So you guys should be doing this and practicing self-custody all the time anyway, getting off those centralized exchanges in uh, any kind of risky scenario, make sure and do it. Use our code down below, it does help the channel. All right, I wanna lead off here with a clip and this is from Yatsu uh, and also with XRP on stage talking about ETFs. Listen in. So obviously on the institutional level with the Bitcoin ETF, the ETH ETF that was just uh, approved in Hong Kong uh, yesterday. How do you see these big events this year along with the halving that is also coming up um, in a few days? How do you see the, these trends being developed in terms of institutional adoption in general and in terms of retail adoption? Yes. Uh, so at Ripple, we have focused our entire business all along on institutions. And we certainly have noticed in the past you know, few quarters here a much stronger lean-in from banks around the world. There's certainly a much stronger liftoff. Hong Kong be another key market in that regard. I think one of the things that's interesting is that we're not done yet with spot ETFs, broadly speaking. So Hong Kong just recently came in together with Ethereum spot ETF, first one in the world, I would say. Then there's Singapore, there's Tokyo, there's London, there's Europe. But I think also, you know, um, you know, CF Benchmarks, for instance, recently actually issued a GameFi index, right? Which basically is just the beginning of another level of institutionalization. Because, of course, these tokens don't trade millions. They trade hundreds of millions of dollars a day. I mean, like Ripple, for instance, as well. You could totally imagine that Ripple would also maybe be an ETF, right? There's ways in which these systems are included. So... So now the institutional adoption gives it that credibility. And of course, the regulators can no longer ignore it. Some of them want to, and actually the ones who don't and actually are afford are winning. So, you know, you hit on a lot of good things there. Uh, institutional adoption kind of mainlines this, and we do see this already happening, obviously, with the success of ETFs here in the U.S. But he also hits on the fact that there is a power center starting to develop in Asia possibly being led by Hong Kong and the ETF for Ethereum, what happens if we could, and even Yatsu was talking about an XRP potential capability. I'm going to go back to an old interview here. This is Garlinghouse, Brad Garlinghouse, in case you guys don't know, I'm sure you do, if you're watching our show right now, but he was talking about an XRP. Listen in. I'm sure you've seen there's buzz out there about potentially an XRP ETF. What do you make of that speculation? Well, Kelly, good to see you. I, I think it only makes sense there will be other ETFs. You know, the, the, the sad reality of what we saw with the Bitcoin ETF is it was only because the courts forced the SEC ha SEC's hand and really Chair Gensler's hand that we saw that finally come to fruition. So you would welcome an XRP ETF then? We would certainly welcome it, and I think it's inevitable that there'll be, you know, multiple ETFs around different uh, tokens. I think you'll even see ETFs potentially around baskets. Are you in talks with the largest issuers, particularly BlackRock, to get this done? Well, uh, I'm not going to comment on that. I know BlackRock has said some things publicly. Uh, you know, we think it makes sense for the XRP community overall. All right, so... I mean, in a, I, I think, tongue-in-cheek for Brett Garlinghouse talking about an XRP ETF, uh, likelihood is there's a good possibility because remember, there's one key thing. XRP is not a security. So that in itself is uh, and could be one of the deciding factors of an ETF playing into it. I'll go to a third clip here. This is Yatsu also at the Ripple talking a little bit more about uh, adoption trends in crypto and how this might play in. Listen in. Your favorite use case. In My Web3. favorite use case. Uh, so I'm still a really strong believer that payments can be a uh, starting, a great starting point for the broader, to really redesign and modernize the financial industry more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I would normally say gaming, which is, of course, a big use case because of digital property rights and because of the fact that 
you know, there's 3 billion gamers in the world who still don't own their assets. But um, I think the narrative for 2024, I think the bigger, bigger use case that I think will bring mass adoption that I think is really exciting is airdrops, right? For instance, in our industry in gaming, we spend over $100 billion advertising video games. But what do we do? We advertise so that people can join our games. And who do we pay? We pay Apple and Google and Facebook and all these platforms, these billions of dollars. And you do this for all sorts of advertising. But how much of that value that we pay Apple and Google actually goes back to the gaming industry? Basically nothing. But what happens with airdrops is that we're actually not paying Apple money, we're paying the gamers money. And we're actually giving value to the gamers. And so the, what excites me is that, you know, many gamers don't understand this, but when you pay a gamer or their target audience, you know, basically value to engage with an ecosystem, the chances that they put back into the ecosystem is way, way higher. And that to me, you know, like in the last three years, not including 24, because there's a lot more, over $21.7 billion dollars was passed to users in the form of airdrops. I mean, that is an insane amount of value that's given to consumer engagement. That's more money than Spotify pays out. That's more money than Facebook. All of you who use Instagram, how much has Instagram paid you for using Instagram? The answer is, of course, zero, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, from a creator side, yes, of course. But, you know, from a user standpoint, I do get uh, Yatsu's point. And I think he's right. I mean, there, this could be, and if you've watched our channel for very long, this is one of the big, I think, hacks of you know, blockchain in general. And that is the potential of creating some brand affinity around airdrops. We talked about it at length around what has happened with the Solana Saga phone, what have, has happened with chapter two, the second version of the Solana Saga phone. And if you followed our channel, you've probably seen some of the success that we've had just in getting people to take a look at this phone because of the airdrops that stack up on these devices. Well, you've also got Nike Artifact. Their crypto universe nears 1.4 billion in NFT trading. Uh, obviously, sneakerheads kind of moving in quickly. I want to show you something right here. The uh, NFT collections right now have generated nearly 1.4 billion in trading volume and 170 million in earnings. And they're just getting started. Now, this is going to go into a lot more around some of the partners and some of the players that are going in this direction and how it all ties into XRP. So stand by for that. If you're not following our channel, first thing I want you guys to do right now, hit subscribe and go down here to this little playlist for XRP and Ripple. What you'll notice here is a couple of uh, videos that we've done in the past. One, of course, is this stablecoin launching potentially on XRP tied into what we'll be talking about today, and that is some of the innovation around Web3. All right, so one note on this is that Ready Player One is connected, uh, and it's connected through Futureverse, which is on XRP. So this ties into a clip that I want to play about Ready Player One. Let me go to that clip. Listen in. Ernie and I actually started talking about Ready Player One when we met here at South By in 2006. The technology wasn't there at the time though, years later, after the movie came out and gave people an idea about the potential of the metaverse. The technology was finally starting to catch up, so we started talking with potential technology partners to help us bring about our ideal version of the metaverse, and that's when we met Sharon Aaron. Finding Easter eggs or something hidden by the creator uh, in a virtual world uh, that I was playing uh, always resonated with me when I was young. And so it was kind of marrying that idea with uh, what if Willy Wonka was a game designer and held his golden ticket contest inside the greatest video game ever created. Uh, uh, so that's the, that's the heart of it. And, uh, uh, and it's kind of, that's the inspiration behind uh, uh, what we're doing in our uh, hunt inside of uh, Open. We're currently developing hunts with a lineup of major brands, which we won't, Aaron, announce today. <laughs> Aaron, don't announce anything for everyone. You won't really know that you're in a hunt until suddenly you realize, oh, I'm a part of a meta internet game, and I've just entered the playing field, and now I can engage with the brands I love, earn rewards that I could have never earned before, keep them in a place where they're easy to find, really, to ac really easy to access, really easy to turn in, multiply. And so Aaron, do not announce them, but if you go back and look at the trailer, you'll find some Easter eggs for some of them. All right, so there's a lot of companies that are starting to play into this. They're alluding to a trailer that is out there on Ready Player One and the Battle Royale. And I'm, I'm gonna go to the clip right here and I'm gonna zoom in on something we found in the trailer. 
This is, and for you guys to follow along, it's about 25 seconds in. Let me kind of zoom in on that right there. And what you'll notice is you, I don't know if you can see that, but that's actually a torn Reebok sticker. So it's likely that we could see Reebok coming in there. And if you go back to the beginning of the, um, of the trailer, I'll play it a little bit, just a little bit there. I don't know if I, it's right there. Let me kind of highlight this because it's, here we go. That's a better shot right there. So what you're seeing there, of course, is Nintendo and Sony. The potential here could be where Sony is also involved in this. So that could be some of the brands that they're alluding to, the likelihood of having some pretty interesting Easter eggs and brands all uh, defining themselves in kind of the future of where this is going. So here is Reebok and Futureverse, back to XRP, are both partnering to deliver the next big thing in digital fashion. So we're going to start to see a lot more of this. They'll de debut the uh, Reebok Impact, which is a digital shoe experience. Remind you of anything? Very similar to what's happened with Nike and Artifact and a lot more. So this is where it's going to get kind of interesting, I think, as we start to flow in some opportunities for XRP. Now, I'm going to go to a clip here that is Reebok and the Futureverse ad. Listen in. All right, so for those of you listening on the audio version of this, first of all, get over here to the YouTube channel because you're going to need to really uh, keep up on it visually. And that was an ad by Reebok. Shows a lot of integration with kind of this digital space where you have a physical and a digital interaction with the device or and or in this case, a product. This is going to happen around brands all over, whether it's fashion, tech brands, restaurant brands, you name it. It's coming into these kinds of components. This next clip will go in a little further on Futureverse and the partnerships and how many more brands are coming. Listen in. It also is a device and a, a mechanic in a shoe that the pump mechanic was something that we felt like hadn't yet been used to its potential. And everyone can believe we're going to an intelligent wearables place and that we're going to leverage all the things in our arsenal to do some really cool never before never been done before activations. And even when we launch what we'll, what we'll launch in, in early 2024, we'll continue to build on that. And we have a roadmap with Reebok that is out three years already of some really cool stuff and spent time with the CEO and, and Todd's a great guy. He's been with the company for 30 years and he has conviction for where they're taking Reebok over the next few years that we're really proud to be aligned with. Brands are raising their hands uh, in ways that I don't think I don't think people will have any idea what's coming in the next few years because everyone wants to jump in first. So this narrative of the metaverse being dead and brands not being sure and we don't know where everything's going to go is not happening behind the scenes. We are kind of tempering the demand based on our capacity, not on the willingness for brands to want to interact with us. So you see the writing on the wall. I think a lot of brands have already started to see one, the success of Nike. Nike, I would say, is the poster child, pretty much kind of the blueprint of how to succeed. And hence, that's why you have Reebok, of course, moving very aggressively into this place. And you also have, and one, one other note before I go into this next you know, component here, and that is that there's been a handful of brands who have stepped out of it, including you know, major brands like Starbucks who have dumped their NFT program. Did they move too early or are they also planning something somewhat secretive? Because I think what's happening right now is all these brands are positioning for a play into the future and no play on Futureverse here, but into the future of where Metaverse is going, where Web3 is going, NFTs, airdrop, connectivity, all that playing into where this could play for a lot of brands. Now, one thing I want to hit on is when you have all that happening behind the scenes and she kind of mentioned it there, Guess who is panicking a little bit? This is Adidas. Now, Adidas is trying to put together a new partnership with Steppen. Everybody remember that name? Probably if you've watched our, sh our show for very long, you probably saw much of the last bull run. Steppen was one of the big breakouts on Solana that was a move to earn project. Let me play this clip for you because it explains a little bit more.
So you guys saw there, if you were on the podcast side, this was tied a little bit more toward Adidas. It was an ad on Adidas tying into a Web3 project that is a move to earn. Now we're talking about the integration of fitness. And this is why all of this plays together around where and what we will be seeing, especially in Web3 projects. So here's Outlier Ventures talking a little bit about this, announcing our first Futureverse Basecamp cohort. We selected, and we showed this the other day, I think, on the show, but uh, seven startups, 500 applicants, a lot of different companies here, some of which I want to really uh, focus in on. One, of course, is Lifelike Digital we'll talk about, and then also Mint Pass we'll talk about, which we're going to have the Mint Pass guys on the show to go a little bit deeper on that. Why is all this important? Well, part of it is because the future of a lot of these integrations is going to be around fitness. And there's some very important things that are happening in the fitness space. Uh, this was the FTC case that shows uh, Mark Zuckerberg wanted the VR fitness app very, very badly. In fact, he went in front of Congress trying to get uh, access to it before they approved the deal. And this is important because Facebook, obviously MetaQuest, and what we've seen with Meta in general, they know, and Zuckerberg knows, this is one of the huge parts of the future of where Metaverse will be, where Web3 will be, a lot of these interactions, and including these quests and things like that for airdrops, all that will play into this. I wanna to go to another clip here, and this clip is gonna go into Zuckerberg downplaying the importance of fitness. Listen in. Thank you, Andrew. Well, the FTC is, is accusing Meta of trying to exert undue dominance in the metaverse. Back in July, the FTC sued to block Meta's acquisition of Within, which operates the popular fitness app in VR called Supernatural. And the FTC claiming that Facebook is trying to create a monopoly in VR fitness apps and that Meta should be developing its own products. Facebook, Meta, and its parent company, Meta, saying that they don't have the capabilities to develop a fitness app on their own. But Zuckerberg was downplaying the importance of the deal in his testimony today, saying fitness is only the fourth or fifth use case in VR behind activities like gaming and social networking. He also said Meta doesn't need to own uh, within in order to make Meta successful in the metaverse. That's a lie. <laughs> Because when you look at the fitness market in general, the potential probably is one of the largest, at least in the early stage. Yes, we'll get into other sectors that will be big, but one of the breakouts will be fitness. Virtual and online fitness market to top $250 billion. This is coming from demands rising because of the devices. Look at these numbers right here. Staggering $256 billion by 2032. It's current 2022 valuation. 15 billion. So you can kind of see that. That's almost 30x in terms of size. And that's not really understanding the real potential of growth if we if we do see a breakout in Web3 and Metaverse, which I believe we will. So a lot of this still kind of uh, moving in. And if, of course, you have to remember that Zuckerberg did get the win in terms of Meta being able to get these, uh, I won't call them, you know, big wins, but they're wins in the sense of being able to control a lot of what's happening in the fitness universe. So a lot of this starts to play in some pretty interesting areas. Now, this is where Life Like Digital comes into play, Web3 company. Jim Vibe, we showed these guys the other day, launching an Apple Vision and MetaQuest app. This course is working closely with, guess what? Futureverse ties in to XRP, now bringing Jim Vibe to the open metaverse. This is a big deal because, again, you start to see how the gateway for all these brands can start to integrate. So it's going to be a race, I think, to some very interesting places right here. Just to show you the Jim Vibe uh, website, this is an AI, think of it like an AI trainer that's helping you, that is really tuned into you. One thing I wanted to focus on, this is the cool part, attractive rewards and incentives for you meeting re your goals. Where else are you doing training where you're getting airdrops or potential awards inside the app? That's the thing that's coming and again, if this market is so big, the opportunity, think next Peloton, but being able to get rewards because you were you know, sweating like a maniac over there. So a lot of opportunities here, and XRP is going to be a big part of this. So this is the other one, Mint Pass. This is one because it's going to be rewarding potential content creators and maybe others that are in the game or in this particular app of being able to actually achieve things. So it's going to reward you in ways to, again, push out what's happening in the travel ecosystem. This will talk about food, potential influencers, what we'll see in all those lifestyle uh, kind of components. 
Another thing I want to hit on, this of course is Mint Pass right here, already active, so they're out there doing it today. A little bit more about them. We're going to get them on the show to talk a little about maybe what the future might hold for Mint Pass. Also tied in to the potential around Futureverse and XRP. Another area you guys need to be focused on is an EVM sidechain for XRP Ledger. This is think of it this as the neon for XRP, except it's you know resident on XRP. That's a big deal because that opens up a lot of opportunity for NFTs, airdrops, all that kind of thing. And really, when you look at the vote that's currently active on this right now, there's not that much left to be done. We just need uh, basically seven more votes. Uh, that would pretty much put this on the map. So another opportunity for XRP. All right, so wrapping this up, let's get into another component here, and that is stable coins. This all plays into this, you'll see in a second, but the course is uh, Senator Lummis and Christian Z Gillibrand, who have now uh, put up their most comprehensive stable coin bill to date. This is a, a huge opportunity for regulation. And when you think about stable coin as a whole, obviously everybody thinks USDC, right? Well, there's some other opportunities out there that could be playing into the hands of Ripple. Remember that this, of course, is Stuart Alderati. He's talking about Ripple will file its response to the SEC's request for the penalties. Remember, this is like the last stage of that trial to get to the penalty phase, and now we're just days away from getting that locked in. We've talked a little bit about this. This means it will be the end. And what does that mean? That means that maybe Ripple can start doing things like IPO, potentially launching of their stablecoin, etc. So a lot of potential huge moves with Ripple. Ripple to launch U.S. stablecoin, taking a $150 billion market dominated by guess who? Tether and Circle. You see how all this is starting to play into a big future for XRP and as the token, but more for Ripple as a company that is starting to play in a lot more places in the market, both in Web3, what we'll see going forward. I want to play this last clip. It's kind of a fun one. This guy's been on our show a couple of times. Whether you like him, you don't like him, he has an interesting take. Listen in. Settlement's happening with the SEC, right? They're working on that right now. To say that Ripple making a stable coin to attach and it will be running on the XRP network is massive because there's obviously more utility. Okay, that's one point. Another point is that when they say they're going to be um, backing this stable coin with US dollars, and U.S. treasuries, that just gave the U.S. government something that they need so desperately that they have lost, and that is a buyer of U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries. Around the world, other countries are not doing it. I have a weird feeling this is part of a backdoor settlement, but I'm obviously not privy to those conversations. So the government is now going to think about this, be able to supply Ripple with these treasuries and dollars to build this network of for the stablecoin, knowing that Ripple has already built tons and tons of uh, relationships around the world with other countries to work on their uh, digital currency, okay, to run on top of XRP. So this is an interesting take because it does put XRP in a very unique position. Remember, a lot of people called them the banker's coin for so long. Could the ninja be right? And uh, how would this play out? Love to get your feedback. Drop some comments down below. It's going to be a wild ride coming up for XRP. So make sure and stay tuned. We'll do some more videos on that. There's a lot more coming down the pipe. So subscribe to the channel right now. And make sure and get in on Diamond Circle. It's our number one place to get additional content. Follow me on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.